Hello and thanks for joining us for today's video where we're going to talk about the unsolved murders of three actors who appeared in television shows and movies. But first, we want to tell you about the latest video on our other channel, Paranormally Listed. It's called Three Creepy Haunted Hotels. It includes a hotel that's off the interstate in Nevada, it's beside a cemetery, and it's full of thousands of clowns. We'll have a link to that video and several other recent videos from Paranormal Listed at the end of this video. I know that most of you check out the channel because you want to hear some crazy true crime stories or use my voice to fall asleep. This isn't one of those YouTube channels where I share intimate details of my life, but I do want to take a minute to talk about gut health. A few years ago, I got an infection in my gut and I ended up in the hospital. Since then, gut health has been incredibly important to me, so I'm happy to talk about our new sponsor, Bellway. Do you know why keeping your gut healthy is so important? It can affect your whole body, especially your digestive system, weight, immune system, heart, brain, hair, skin, and nails. Besides keeping your gut healthy, Bellway fiber can also help you lose weight. That's because it contains the super fiber, psyllium husk, which makes you feel full for a long time after you eat. So you eat less throughout the day and it cuts down on cravings. Psyllium husk also helps keep you regular without making you run to the bathroom. And it works. In fact, I'll show you my bowel movements just to prove it. No way. No, I'm just kidding. But what I'm not kidding about is how great Bellway fiber is. Not only does Bellway work, but because it's flavored with real fruit, it tastes great. I got raspberry lemon, and even if it didn't help my gut and help me lose weight, I'd drink it because it tastes that good. Also, Bellway is organic, all-natural, vegan, keto, paleo-friendly, gluten-free, and it contains zero sugar. Bellway has some great deals on the website. For example, you save by getting three or six tubs of fiber. Trust me, you'll be using their products regularly. They also have capsules that are great for people on the go or who don't want powdered drinks. I really hope you take care of your gut because I don't want you to end up in the hospital like I did. And Bellway is a great, tasty way to do it. I have a special offer for you. Use my code CL25 at the checkout. You'll get 25% off your first order at Bellway. Just click on the link in the description box below this video. Number 3. Barbara Colby Barbara Colby was born in New York City in July 1939 and she grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana. Colby started acting after high school. Her first major role was in the play Six Characters in Search of an Author in 1964. The following year she made her Broadway debut appearance in The Devils. She continued to perform in Broadway plays for the next three years. In 1967, she had a small, uncredited role in the film, The Tiger Makes Out. Another uncredited role followed this in Richard Lester's movie, Petulia. In 1968, Colby joined the America Conservatory Theater in San Francisco, California. She was the theater's leading actress for two years. That same year, she married Robert Daniels Levitt Jr. Levitt was the son of famed actress and singer Ethel Merman. Colby had her first credited role on television in 1969 on a two-part episode of the police procedural NYPD. In 1970, she relocated to Los Angeles, California where she continued to act on stage. But she was hoping to break into television or film. Los Angeles Times did a full story about Colby in which she is called a new breed of professional actress. In 1971, Colby landed a role in the popular crime drama Columbo. This was the start of a string of guest spots on some of the most popular TV shows of the 1970s, including The Odd Couple, McMillan and Wife, Kung Fu, and Gunsmoke. Then, in 1974, Colby got her big break. She was cast in the Mary Tyler Moore show as a streetwise sex worker named Sherry. In the episode, Moore's character, Mary, spends a night in jail with Sherry. The producers were impressed with Colby, so they brought her character back the following season. 
The Mary Tyler Moore Show was incredibly popular and it spawned a spin-off, Rhoda. The producers decided to develop another spin-off based on Mary's former landlord, Phyllis, played by Cloris Leachman. In Phyllis, the titular character moves back to her hometown, San Francisco, California, with her daughter. In San Francisco, Phyllis gets a job at a photography studio run by Julie Erskine. The producers of the show decide to cast Barbara Colby as Julie. It was finally Colby's big break into the world of television. Unfortunately, while Colby's professional life was going well, her personal life was not. She and her husband were separated. However, Colby remained close to her mother-in-law, Ethel Merman. On July 24, 1975, Colby taught an acting class in West Los Angeles. After class, close to midnight, Colby was walking to her car with one of her students, 35-year-old James Kiernan. Kiernan had recently filmed a guest spot for the other Mary Tyler Moore spin-off, Rhoda. Suddenly, two gunshots rang out. Barbara Colby was shot in the shoulder and James Kiernan was shot in the chest with a 22 caliber handgun. 36-year-old Barbara Colby died at the scene. Kiernan was rushed to the hospital. He told the police that they were shot by two men who were black and in their early 20s and they were driving a light-colored van. Unfortunately, 35-year-old James Kiernan died at the hospital. The police were baffled by the crime. There was no attempt to rob Colby and Kiernan. The gunman didn't threaten them or even say anything before they shot them. What was odd was that it was not the only violent incident that happened in West Los Angeles that night. Within 40 minutes, there were two other violent crimes. Roland and Gloria Witt were out for dinner with another couple. Roland Witt was an aerospace executive with Lockheed Aircraft Company. Three masked men jumped out of the bushes when they arrived at the other couple's home. They were ordered to lie face down on the lawn. Encouraged by her husband, Gloria Witt ran. One of the men was armed with a shotgun. He fired seven or eight times at Gloria as she ran, and she was hit twice. 57-year-old Gloria Witt died as a result of her wounds. In another incident, two couples returned to one of their homes when five men in masks approached them and forced them into their home. They stole some cash and jewelry and ransacked the home. The two couples were left unharmed. The police arrested six men in the hours after the three attacks, but they were later released. About a month later, five of the men were arrested for two of the attacks that happened that night. They said they were driving around looking for people driving expensive cars. Then they followed them home, expecting to rob them. However, they claimed they had nothing to do with the murders of Barbara Colby and James Kiernan. The police also saw that the murders of the actors didn't fit the profiles of the other two attacks. The motive behind the others was robbery and there was no attempt to rob Colby and Kiernan. Their murders were completely unprovoked. Plus, they were shot by two men in a light-colored van. The other attacks involved five men in a car. So the police ruled out the five men and the murders of Colby and Kiernan. The police concluded that Colby and Kiernan were victims of a random drive-by shooting. When Colby was killed, she had recorded three episodes of Phyllis. The producers considered canceling the show, but ultimately decided against it. Instead, Colby's character was recast and Liz Torres got the role. Phyllis lasted for two seasons before CBS canceled it. It's been over 47 years since the two actors were killed. The police have no promising clues in the case, and it's doubtful the case will be solved unless someone comes forward with information. 
Number two, Jack Nance. Melvin John Nance, who went by Jack, was born in Boston, Massachusetts in December 1943. He grew up in Dallas, Texas. He started acting as a child and traveled around the United States performing in children's theaters. He performed with the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco for eight years. In the mid-1960s, he was one of the finalists for the role of Ben Braddock in The Graduate. The filmmakers ended up going with Dustin Hoffman, which was his big break. The Graduate was nominated for seven Academy Awards, including a Best Actor nomination for Hoffman. Around the same time, Nance also got the role of Perry Smith in the adaptation of Truman Capote's true crime classic, In Cold Blood. But he lost the role to Robert Blake. In 1968, Nance married Catherine E. Coulson. In the early 1970s, Nance landed his first two movie roles. The first was a bit part in the 1970 film Fools, and this was followed by a small role in 1971's Jump, also known as Fury on Wheels. In 1972, Jack Nance was living in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and he auditioned for a student film. After the audition, the director of the film walked Nance out to his car. They came across a Volkswagen with a homemade wooden roof rack. Nance said that he was impressed with the woodwork. The director told him he owned the car he had made the roof rack. Nance and the director talked for a while, and as they spoke, the director knew he had found his lead actor. The director's name was David Lynch, and he was casting the role of Henry Spencer in his film Eraserhead. Eraserhead was only supposed to be 20 minutes long, and it would take six weeks to shoot. But then it evolved into a feature-length film. Lynch ended up filming the movie in pieces over the next five years. After the film was released in March 1977, its popularity grew slowly. The film eventually found an audience in the midnight movie circuit and became a cult hit. It also established Lynch as a writer-director and led to his next project, The Elephant Man. Lynch wanted to cast Nance in the lead role, but it did not work out. Instead, John Hurt was cast as Jack Merrick. Both Lynch and Hurt were nominated for Academy Awards for their work on The Elephant Man. The Elephant Man was one of the few projects directed by Lynch that didn't include Nance. Nance had small roles in many of Lynch's most famous movies, including Dune, Blue Velvet, and Lost Highway. He also had small roles in other films not directed by Lynch, including Ghoulies, The Hotspot, and Meatballs 4. In 1976, Nance and his wife, Catherine E. Coulson, divorced. Throughout his adult life, Nance suffered from alcoholism. In 1986, while shooting Blue Velvet, Nance sought the help of Dennis Hopper. Hopper had just gone clean himself. Nance said he would jump out of his hotel window if Hopper didn't help him. So Hopper got him into a rehabilitation center in Los Angeles. At the rehab center, Nance met Kelly Jean Van Dyke. Kelly was the daughter of actor-comedian Jerry Van Dyke and the niece of Dick Van Dyke. Kelly had her own problems with drugs and alcohol and she was trying to get out of the porn industry. In 1990, Jack Nance's life seemed to be going well. He had a memorable role in Lynch's surprise hit television show, Twin Peaks. He plays a logger who finds the dead body of homecoming queen, Laura Palmer. In May 1991, Nance and Kelly Van Dyke were married. But not long after the wedding, Kelly started drinking and doing drugs again. She also started doing porn to support her habits. By the autumn of that year, Nance told her he didn't want to be with her if she was going to keep drinking and doing drugs. 
On November 17, 1991, Nance was at Bass Lake, California, filming Meatballs 4. He was on the phone with Kelly, who was threatening to kill herself. She told him that she would go through with it if he hung up. Minutes later, a terrible storm knocked out the phone lines at Nance's cabin. Nance and the movie director managed to find a working phone and they called the police. The police went to Kelly's home. They broke in and found her dead body. 33-year-old Kelly Jean Van Dyke had hanged herself. Nance continued to stay sober through the early 1990s. He got small parts in mostly forgettable movies like Voodoo starring Corey Feldman and Secret Agent Club starring Hulk Hogan. In the mid-1990s, Nance started drinking again. In 1997, Nance played a small role as a car mechanic in David Lynch's Lost Highway. Interestingly, the film featured a memorable character played by Robert Blake, whom Nance lost the role of Perry Smith in In Cold Blood 30 years earlier. Years after appearing in Lost Highway, Blake would be arrested and tried for the murder of his wife. On December 29, 1996, Jack Nance met a couple of his friends for lunch. They noticed he had a black eye. Nance explained that he went to Winchell's Donut Shop at about 4 in the morning. He mouthed off to two guys he described as Latinos in their early 20s. He went inside, and when he came out, the two men were waiting for him. They got into a fist fight, and Nance was punched in the head. After lunch, Nance said he had a headache, and he was going home. The next day, one of Nance's friends went to his apartment in Pasadena. He found the 53-year-old actor dead. An autopsy revealed that Jack Nance had died from blood force trauma. The medical examiner labeled his death a homicide. Unfortunately, the police had very little information to go on. No one at the donut shop saw the fight or knew who the men were. Nance also didn't describe the men beyond saying they were Latino men in their 20s. So the case seems unlikely to be solved unless someone comes forward. It's been 26 years since Jack Nance was killed and the case is considered ice cold. Oddly enough, this is not the only unsolved murder linked to a racer head. Peter Ivers scored the film and he wrote the music and sang the song In Heaven, Lady and the Radiator Song. In 1983, Ivers was murdered in his Los Angeles apartment. We'll cover his case in our upcoming video, Three Unsolved Murders of Musicians. Number 1. Jenny Maxwell Jennifer Helene Maxwell was born in September 1941 in Brooklyn, New York. She was the only daughter of Norwegian immigrants. In 1958, 14-year-old Jenny was enrolled in drama school in New York City. One day, director Vincent Manelli was visiting the school. Vincent had been married to Judy Garland and their daughter was Liza Manelli. Vincenti was impressed with Jenny and convinced her to come to Hollywood to read for a movie he was directing. The movie was Some Came Running, starring Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and Shirley MacLaine. Jenny did not get the part, but she did land other roles. Her first role was in the sitcom Bachelor Father, where she plays the high school rival of one of the main characters. This was followed by a guest spot on the hit sitcom Father Knows Best. On the set of Father Knows Best, she met 24-year-old Paul Rapp. Paul was working as an assistant director. Paul and Jenny started a whirlwind romance that resulted in them eloping in April 1958. Jenny was only 17 years old. The following year, she gave birth to a son, Brian. However, the marriage didn't last long. 
The couple separated in December 1961. Jenny continued to land TV roles on shows like Bonanza and The Twilight Zone. Then came her big break. She played the spoiled teenager, Ellie, in the musical romantic comedy Blue Hawaii, starring Elvis Presley. Arguably, Jenny's most memorable scene is when Presley's character spanks her for being naughty. In December 1963, Jenny and Paul's divorce was settled. She was awarded custody of their son, Brian. Jenny continued to get roles in television shows and movies into the mid-1960s. One of her biggest roles was in Take Her, She's Mine, starring Jimmy Stewart. Unfortunately, Jenny's private life was falling apart. She enjoyed the Hollywood lifestyle, which included drugs, alcohol, and a revolving door of men. But Jenny indulged in the lifestyle too much, and she lost custody of Brian. In 1968, Jenny decided to clean up her life and get Brian back. She thought that in order to do this, she needed to retire from acting. Her last role was a guest spot on the show The Wild Wild West in 1968. After that, at the age of 27, Jenny was no longer acting. She eventually got her son back. In February 1970, Jenny married a well-known divorce lawyer who was 21 years older than her, Irvin Rader, who went by the name Tip. Before becoming a lawyer, Tip had been a police officer. He had a shady reputation and he liked for people to think he had mob connections. Unfortunately, the marriage wasn't a happy one. Jenny and Tip constantly fought. Jenny filed for divorce several times, but she didn't follow through with it. By 1978, Jenny had enough and she was ready to be done with the marriage. But her lawyer suggested staying with Tip until their 10th wedding anniversary because she would get a bigger settlement. So Jenny decided to stay, but she wasn't faithful. However, neither was Tip. Shortly after their 10th wedding anniversary, Jenny and Brian moved out. Around the same time, Tip had a strange experience. A prowler supposedly shot him in his backyard. Tip was wounded, but it was superficial. It looked like a bullet had grazed him. Some of Tip's friends thought he lied about the prowler, and for some unknown reason, he had grazed himself with the bullet. He refused to report the incident to the police. On June 9, 1981, Jenny had minor surgery at Cedar sinai Hospital. Tip offered to drive her home when she was released the next day. Jenny accepted the offer. Tib and Jenny went out to lunch and then they went to Jenny's condo. In the lobby, both Tip and Jenny were shot. 39-year-old Jenny Rader died at the scene. 60-year-old Tip Rader was taken to the hospital and died hours later. The story from the media was that it was a robbery gone wrong. No arrests were made in the case and the news quickly stopped reporting on it. For decades, the official story was that it was a robbery gone wrong. However, Jenny's family wasn't convinced that it was a botched robbery. They thought it was a mob hit because of Tip's shady relationships. Then in 2019, a journalist named Buddy Morehouse with the Livingston Post in Livingston County, Michigan, decided to investigate the case. Jay Rader was his mother's first cousin and his mother's health was failing. She had always wondered what happened to her cousin. Morehouse talked to a detective with Los Angeles Department's Wilshire Detective Bureau. The detective found the original case file which had the names of the two detectives who were assigned to the case. One of them had died, but Morehouse managed to track down the other detective, Mike Thies. These told them that they had solved a major part of the case in the weeks after the murders. 
In May 2019, Morehouse flew to Los Angeles and met with Thies. Thies told him that Tip was angry that Jenny would get a huge settlement from the divorce. In the months before the shooting, Tip had apparently asked three people to kill Jenny and her lover, but they had all turned him down. It's believed that Tip found someone to kill Jenny, and then the gunman was supposed to shoot him, but only wound him. This would give Tip plausible deniability if he became a suspect. But the gunman screwed up and fairly shot Tip. Thieves never thought it was a robbery because nothing had been stolen from the couple. Also, the couple was shot with a rare type of ammo. The same type of ammo was found in Tip's car. Thieves said that they never closed the case because they never found the shooter. His identity is still a mystery over 40 years later. But Thieves said that they are confident the Tip Raider was the mastermind of the shooting. Buddy Morehouse wrote a book about Jenny and her murder called The Murder of an Elvis Girl, Solving the Jenny Maxwell Case. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now, and there's a link in the description box below this video. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.